The first section is the Egyptian roots of sound science. And this quote is from Jehuti, Thoth or Tot, Hermes. What is below is like that which is above, and what is above is like that which is below to accomplish the miracle of the one thing. It's sometimes called the great work. And this image is a papyrus that is duplicating what is on the ceiling at the Temple of Dendera, Egypt. So we have the celestial patterns above and the music below. The sky and its stars make music to you. The sun and the moon praise you. The Neteru sing to you. And that is from the temple at Dendera. This temple is a perfect example of the principle of as above, so below. It has the heavenly zodiac above, and the temple carvings on the pillars and the walls are all dedicated to musical instruments and the goddess Hathor, goddess of music and transformation. And here you see the sistrum, the musical rattles with Hathor on them. Hathor listens to the eternal music of creation, similar to the ancient Hindu cow goddess Vak. She is Logos, mother of the Vedas, Vak, Vaka, Vos, voice. It's the root for our word for voice. Vak preceded Saraswati, and she's not well known anymore, but she is the mother of voice and song. Mother of all mantras, I utter the word that gods and men alike shall welcome. I make them mighty. My word makes a sage, a rishi and a Brahmin, and that is from the Vedas. My word, my song, creates a different being. Your word, your song, does that. Here is Thoth in the Hatshepsut temple. Thoth is the oldest son of Ra, and he hatched the world egg. He's an ibis bird. This work of creation he accomplished by the sound of his voice. He is the most powerful friend of the soul, and through the trueness of his voice, contributes to the soul's resurrection. We will learn at the end of the presentation also that he was the guide of Osiris and Isis. Through the trueness of your voice, your voice, you are resurrected. So when we purify the voice through breath work, chanting, meditation, toning, releasing, our voice becomes clear and it becomes a healing balm for the world and others. Egyptian temple music was guided by Thoth and his beloved Ma'at, goddess of truth. They taught that by continual singing of harmonious chants, humans grew unto, like unto the gods. Also, when we sing in nature, the trees expand their force field. The stones in the stone circles in Great Britain, we did this dowsing test over and over and over. Everything increases its energy field with sacred song, with well-intentioned tones. 
The singing of hymns on earth is the reflection of heavenly harmony. The hymns of Hermes, these are actual texts that you can read. G.S. Mead, G.R.S. Mead uh, translated quite a few of them. The hymns of Hermes state that sacred sounds pour forth blessings and open a path throughout nature straight to the divine. The Vedas say that it is the fastest way to enlightenment and awakening. Sacred sound. The Egyptian texts say that Isis, Queen of Heaven, received the secret name of Ra. Actually, she tricked it out of him. He was uh, bitten by a venomous snake, and he was dying. Ra is actually more than our sun. It is this energy behind the brilliance in the sun. You could call it the great central sun. So Ra was dying and Isis tricked him out of his secret name because with that name, she could do anything. She had the sound codes of creation. She uttered the spell with the magical power of her mouth. Her tongue was perfect and it never halted at a word. Beneficent in command and word was Isis the woman of magical spells. Now I put the references here so that if you want to further research these sources, there is a tremendous amount of information available. With this key, Isis chanted the dismembered parts of Osiris back together. Remember, he was cut into 14 pieces by his brother Set. Thou wilt enchant the sky, the earth, the abyss, the mountains, and the sea. Thou wilt understand the language of the birds. I always wondered where that language of the birds, they call it the green language in alchemy. I wondered where that came from. Of course, it had to come from Isis, and here she is with her great wings, the language of the birds. Knowing the technology and the science of sound. In Egyptian papyri, Isis changed into a swallow and cried and whistled as she circled the dead body of her beloved Osiris. It's interesting because every place that has a black Madonna in France, or Europe in general, or a temple to Isis or Mary Magdalene has swallowed circumambulating every day in the season, in spring and summer and fall, and they are whistling, and their whistling creates a beat frequency, which is two tones almost rubbing really close but even more close than that. And it creates an altered state, sort of like this whistling flute. The song of Isis enchanted and infused Osiris with life to give birth to their child, to their creation, Horus. The swallow hieroglyph in Egyptian language means great. The Egyptian wur means to anoint. So these are connected with Isis, the great winged one. I have a sense that she's one of those of the bird tribes that came a long, long time ago. And when you go into many ancient traditions, you find people that are with wings or manifestations of birds like Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent. He's plumed, he's a feathered serpent. 
The transformation into a swallow is one of the magical texts in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The words of power in this text restored life after death to both Osiris and the scribe Ani to fly freely as a swallow. And here you see the swallow on the bark of the sun. This is the hieroglyph. On the bark of the sun, the swallow is the first to announce the return of the light, singing the dawn of a new day. This is a translation by Normandy Ellis of part of the Egyptian Book of the Dead about Isis turning into a swallow. In the dark marrow of my bones, I have made myself light. I am the swallow spinning at dawn through whom light enters the sky, who flies formless above a world of forms ringing across the horizon. Enter me, I shall make you a god, she cried. Enchantress and wife, she stamps and spins, she raises her arms to dance, and from her armpits rises a hot perfume that fills the sails of boats along the Nile. She stirs the breezes that make the sailors swoon. Under her spell, I come to myself. Under her body, I come to life. She dances and draws down heaven. As above, so below. And this is a voice print of a swallow song. The dominant notes are C sharp and F sharp. Here we have those frequencies emanating as elements and color from one of the largest stars in our galaxy, Eta Carinae. Interesting, one of the largest stars in our galaxy is emanating these frequencies. And the swallows are mirroring on the earth that song. The Egyptian manuscripts have shown musical notation using seven tones or notes and seven colors. The French Egyptologist M. Villotou found that Egyptian harps had colored strings to match the musical notation. And here you see a seven-stringed harp. And here there are seven notes to an octave on my harp and they are colored. So this is a very ancient tradition. This occurred on my wall one day, the crystal in the window refracted perfectly to make the shadow of seven strings and the colors of the rainbow and the seven tones. And we have the seven tones and colors in the human energy system. This is the harpist of Ma'at from the tomb of Ramses III, Thebes. I would like to have a harp like that, wouldn't you? We have some harpists right in the front here. <laughs> Maybe we should commission someone to make one. The Egyptian temples were built in alignment with the heavens. Each temple is tuned to a unique musical scale based on its dimensions and sacred proportions. In the early 90s, I was working with Carol Horn and Antoine Sarand in Egypt. And I guess my first trip there was in 87, and I noticed that the temple walls of Abydos were ringing 
singing back to me. I was dumbstruck. I was shaken. I had never had that experience anywhere, singing or playing the harp. And so I went back in 91 with Antoine and Carol, and we did research in measuring the, the chambers and finding the dominant tones. Antoine approached it in a very logical, scientific way, and my way was intuitive. And through audio response, just listening to the sounds that rang out louder in each chamber. But we came to the same conclusions, which gave me great confidence in the power of intuition, in the power to hear our own songs and not question it. So I'm going to um, share with you a song based on that tuning. It's called Sara. Because we're talking about the sevens, I'll play it in a seven rhythm. So the rhythms and the tones are both important. So I'll play it in this proposed temple scale for Abydos. So just relax and dream a little bit. Imagine that you're in the temple of your choice. It could be Abydos, Aquilae, Dendera.
Music was used to regulate the material and immaterial worlds. A string resonates with the macrocosm of the universe and the microcosm of the human soul. In the hymns of Hermes, the order of singers maintained the harmonious patterns, enchanting earth and sky. Thoth, or Jehuti, is the tongue of Ra. What emanates from the opening of his mouth cometh to pass. He is the source of speech, the vehicle of knowledge, and the power of the spoken word. In the manuscript called The Key, Hermes teaches the way to enlightenment by chanting hymns of praise and pouring these blessings on all beings. The hymns of Hermes use sacred words of power to raise the inner resonance, and one became as a god. The serpent was said in the Book of Moses to be the most wise and knowledgeable of all creatures. Somehow it fell just like Eve. What a shame. But we're here to retrieve the serpent of knowledge. In the legend of the twins Amphion and Zethos, they were from Greece, they conquered uh, Thebes. It fell to them by the power of music. Hermes had given Amphion a lyre, and when the twins conquered Thebes, it was the sound that caused the stones to slide effortlessly into place. And these are not small stones. In Tibet, Swedish aircraft engineer Henry Kjelsen witnessed 200 llamas levitating huge blocks of stone up a 400-meter cliff. That's not 400 feet, that's 400 meters, a little over a yard. The llamas used chant, drums, and trumpets to concentrate a laser-like beam of sound energy. Hermetic sound science can be found in the roots of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, as well as Buddhism, as well as most indigenous cultures around the earth. The mystical sects of all these traditions used purification with sound to build a diamond body of light to become Christed or Osirified here you see the diamond, double diamond body around Yeshua. This is a window, very powerful spot in the crypt at Roslyn Chapel. This is still practiced by Tibetan Buddhists in achieving the diamond or rainbow body. When Rinpoche Kempo Achos passed away in 1998 at his Tibetan hermitage, his disciples witnessed rainbows in the sky, sweet fragrance, and music as if someone were singing. Now it goes both ways. It's a co-created process. It wasn't just the music after his death, but he used chanting continually to create that rainbow body. Meditation, breath work, chanting, being still, drinking from the still waters of that grail cup. Ah, Red Tara. So I'd like to invite you to chant along with me this mantra. This helps all of us to not just build a diamond body, which many of us may not ever do that, but chanting clears energy. 
It helps to release heaviness, karma, tiredness. It does two things. It dissolves what we don't need and it builds that which serves us. And especially if we're using ancient mantras, it's even more powerful because these mantras are added. The energy when we chant them is added to all of those throughout time who ever chanted those mantras. It's like a huge sound bank. And forget the money bank. Let's create a sound bank for this new era. The sounds that we chant together can dissolve past limitations and clear the path for unlimited potentiality. Not only for ourselves personally, but for our planet, for our beloved Earth, and all beings. By the way, uh, Bardo Rinpoche is going to be in Phoenix uh, this next weekend. He's from Woodstock, New York. He actually just uh, moved into a new uh, monastery in New York nearby Woodstock, but he is the Rinpoche who um, came to Sedona many, many years ago and gave us a very powerful teaching about the power of sound, and it happened to be on the eve of my departure for England, leading a group and doing chants in Stonehenge. And I thought, oh, this is so perfect. And what he said is that when you do a mantra in a sacred place like Sedona or anywhere that is sacred to you, that benevolent power is multiplied more than a thousand times. Or if you write the mantra in the, in the sand at the beach or in the soil out in nature or over the lintel over the door, it blesses all those who pass through that door. So I'd like you to join me in doing the Red Tara Mantra. When I asked the uh, Rinpoches that um, I know, I wanted to know what it is about the Red Tara. Of course, she's very strong in her red aspect. There are 21 aspects to the Taras. In her red, she's a very fierce protectress very strong. So if you need protection or strength or energy, you could chant to her. The words are Om Tare Tum Soha. When I asked about the purpose of doing this chant, I was told that it helps create you as a Tara, you as a Buddha. So it develops that inner essence, that ground luminosity of Buddhahood. Oh. 
Song of Sion. Here you see Mary Magdalene in her chapel in Friendly Chateau. Samuel told King Saul, You shall meet a band of angels, actually prophets, maybe they were angels, a band of prophets coming from a high place with harp, drum, flute, and lyre, and they will be prophesying. These prophets, after the age of prophets, disappeared in the Judaic tradition. The women stepped forward with their songs to become the prophets. The bath kol, or bat kol, translates directly to daughters of voice. They were the Hebrew prophets and singers, and their sound opened the gates of heaven so that they could receive the voice of Shekinah, the voice of wisdom. As the word became flesh in Jesus, so did the Bath Kol, daughter of the voice, become flesh in Maria Sophia. And here we see Mary Magdalene on the shores of Provence, near Sambom, where she came ashore in the boat with no oars. Now it's interesting, my friend Henry Lincoln said that the ancient tradition of coming ashore with, in a boat with no oars usually indicated it was someone, someone of a royal bloodline descent. This image is from the wonderful chapel at Sambom. Wearing nothing but her hair each morning, a group of angels lifted Magdalene above the summit of the cliffs where she could listen to the entire choir of angelic hosts, the divine sounds of original and continuing creation. Temple singers used specific tones to create healing in body, mind, and soul. Sufi sound science teaches that our voice is an instrument for healing and also the barometer of our state of being. It tells us where we are in our evolution, in our state of emotional, physical, and mental. It tells a story the quality of our voice, and it also informs others how to respond to us. If you've ever heard a recording of your voice and said, ooh, that voice deepens and expands through regular toning and chanting. It's how to develop it so that when you speak, people will listen. I had very powerful relationships in my past with men of great stature. 
They were well-respected experts in their fields. And no one ever listened to me. I would say something and it was as if I was invisible. Until I started working with sound and developing my own energies and my own voice. Musical instruments like David's harp were used by all the prophets in order to enter into an ecstatic mood before receiving the spirit of prophecy. This is from the texts of the Zohar, which are the esoteric Kabbalah aspect of Judaism. Many people say that they were composed in the 12th century in a place called Girona, where I'm going this May. Um, we have a tour there working with a wonderful woman who has studied these traditions for a very long time. So these were traditions that were used around the world. Using shamans use music to enter an altered state. We can use music, drumming, chanting, whatever is our inclination to expand our energy field, open ourselves up to greater potentiality. So, looking at this image, just to observe it a bit. And then close your eyes. Make sure you're in a relaxed position and uncross your legs. And we're going to chant together Yod He Vov He. This is a very powerful chant in the Judaic tradition, the ancient Hebrew syllables. They're like bijas, creative seeds to clear and develop potentiality, to create what our true vision is. So with your eyes closed, join me in this Look at the image again when you're ready. Take a deep breath, a sigh on the exhale. And see if it looks different. Did anything change? Any feedback from the audience? Any change that you're aware of? Yes. More colors. 
Ah, you see things that you didn't see before. A heart. Uh huh. Things and what? The temple is bigger, it grew. The doorway seems to be more inviting. It has dimensionality. Toning and chanting benefits. These are just a few. They, it increases sensory perception, as you just discovered, clarity, and intuition. Toning and chanting releases limiting beliefs, stress, and dis-ease. It charges the brain and alters our brain state, inducing alpha-theta states which are associated with healing. We did experiments in the research labs at the University of Washington Medical Center and found that dowsers, shamanic healers, energy workers, and toners like me all entered the alpha, then theta, and even delta states when we were in the process of opening. It synchronizes the heart-brain-body rhythms, producing a state of centeredness, balance, and integrity. You feel a bit of that tonight, probably, and in your own practices, I'm sure many of you have. It dissolves the veils to remembering original intention. That is one of the greatest gifts that this toning and chanting and sacred music making can do. I don't want to leave out dance, but that's just not my job this lifetime. I love to dance. And often the dance goes with the song. It expands our life potential and creativity, opening a gateway for soul freedom. And what you're hearing is an aeolian harp, wind harp, placed in the center of Stonehenge on a summer solstice. Just the natural sounds of the wind through the strings. And this is a natural occurrence that happened to my friend Eileen Nauman at Rainbow Bridge, Devil's Bridge, Sedona. The sun was nowhere close to that part of the sky. And it was after they offered prayers and flute and drum song and this appeared and everybody was on their knees. This appeared right in front of Madonna Rock. Here's the Madonna and Child right at the Chapel of Holy Cross. In Nicholas Mann's pentagram landscape temple of Sedona, it's the center of the pentagram. We'll learn more about pentagrams later. This occurred after I was up there chanting with my granddaughter um, songs to Our Lady and days before the big tsunami in Indonesia. There's the DNA spiral going through there. And here's another image from genetics of the DNA spiral. Russian biophysicist, <laughs> any Russian speakers here? Um, anyway, he found that human DNA can be reprogrammed with harmonious sound and positive language. This is the ancient hermetic knowledge of the power of mantras and sound. Mantras are formulas to vibrate the highest human potential and re-enchant our world. As I was saying about the University of Washington research, here is a uh, chart of some of the uh, testing of what happened to the brain. This is the beginning. I guess I already had a fair amount of theta going on. 
I had been listening to the Songaya CDs that you'll hear later on, and then toning with them really peaked the theta level, the theta, the green, the alpha is the red, beta over here, and delta, the really deep level on, in the blue. Then the, both the alpha thetas peaked. The brain went into an altered state, and then they totally balanced. So these are some of the things that happen when you're toning and chanting. This is a energy field imaging um, machine that was testing in Mexico City many years ago, coming off the Avenue Insurgentes, the largest, most congested road that I know of in the world. I think it is the longest in the Americas. And it was fairly stressful, and the aura field is quite lopsided and very high beta, beta brain state not high beta, just beta state. And after one minute of doing Om Mani Padme Hum, this was an old photo, so this is faded a bit, but these were very brilliant, deep royal blues and purples that were developed, which indicated uh, entry into the alpha theta state. Here's our friend Ashok Kumara chanting with a wonderful orb on the side of his head. I'm sure he didn't even know. And I'm playing for a mass for a dear friend who passed over, and I'm chanting. And my friend took this, and then there are various other little orbs around. It's a church in rennes le bain France. What in the world is the song of the resonant green snake? Do you know the Goethe story about the green snake? He wrote about this. We're going to learn a little bit about the green snake. This is St. John Lazarus in the San Lazar Church in a place called Avalon, France. Here we see, in principio erat verbum, in the beginning was the word. We see this lovely serpent coming out of his cup. Here he is again in a Catholic church in Massachusetts, Westford. Now it's a green snake. This is a well-known alchemical symbol of resurrection and renewal, coming awake, and it's in his cup, the grail cup. It's in Trois Cathedral, southeast of Paris, another green snake, but this time it's a feathered serpent, just like Quetzalcoatl in the Mesoamerican tradition. We find the same symbology all over the world, rooted in the earth and sprouting wings, balanced. Transformation, resurrection. Here we see it in the image from Egypt, the serpent shape can be symbolic of energy movement, water, wisdom, kundalini rising, sound waves, resurrection, and it happens to be the symbol for the age of Aquarius. Two squiggly lines, just like two snakes. That's the age we're entering into. So I think it's high time we retrieved the snake Here's the front of the same Saint Lazare church in France, Avalon, France. Look at all these amazing serpents on the front. 
It's a resurrection chapel. By the way, the nearby next village is Vesale, where Mary Magdalene has her church, Basilica. They were brother and sister, and they worked together closely in the resurrection mysteries. This window is in the Madeleine Church in Rennes-le-Chateau, and the sun was over in the west, which is behind my head when I took the shot. This was a miracle of Lazarus rising, I felt, out of his window. That's Lazarus rising's window. Lazarus received the resurrection mysteries teaching from Yeshua as recorded in the secret gospel of Mark. It was an all-night ceremony. And here's a quote from the Pistis Sophia in the words of Yeshua. Magdalene and John, the Virgin, will tower over all my disciples and all men who shall receive the mysteries. Well, we've moved on now. It's available for all of us. That's the good news. Here's a performance with an altar to St. John as the eagle of the four four apostles. That's my friend Francoise and myself. Trois Cathedral was the place where the Grail Mysteries were written. Trois was the center of Knights Templar. It's where Joan of Arc rode her horse onto the high altar and proclaimed for the people's liberation of France. She rode her horse up onto the high altar. She had some energy, that girl. We all love her. Here's the Apostle of the Apostles in Saint-Michel, Terrascon sur Oriège, near the Pyrenees, the foothills. From the Pistis Sophia Codex, it says, I have had faith in the light, and it remembered me and heard my song. He has placed in my mouth a new song Sing praises to the light, and I will bring you to the region from which you descended. That's the work of Sophia, to retrieve souls. Sophia simply means wisdom, chokmah, wisdom. Pistis is faith. She had faith in the wisdom. wonderful winged Isis pregnant with the bridal knot at her belly. This is a chateau near where I live in France part-time where we do different events. It was also an observatory for the heavenly cycles in the medieval era. There are 14 of these gorgeous girls with serpent bodies. This is a billboard on the way to my village in a place called Limou. It's famous for its original formula of champagne. The grail cup is filled with golden elixir, the serpent green and winding and entwining as the vine, the temple behind. And here is a wonderful alchemical image from the fifth century. The alchemy of the nine musical spheres of creation and the nine muses. The serpent flows freely and easily through the spheres as the life force and divine song of creation. We have the Jed Pillar of Osiris. And kind of similar in the U.S. genetics image. We find these images everywhere. Sound, breath, and meditation is the key to awakening the internal serpentine pillar of light.
This is the Taoist circuit, the circulation of the breath, which I highly recommend. Circulating the breath up and down. And if you put the tongue at the roof of the mouth as you're doing this in your meditation, it helps the circulating of that inner serpentine flow wave of energy. Awakening the inner cauldrons of fire. They also call it the opening of the golden flower. This is a cymatics image whereby a pure tone was emanated and it created a perfect mandala. It's called cymatics, sound moving form. That's what you do when you're chanting or toning. The focus and breath follow the naughty serpent paths to awaken the inner cauldrons. Now if you do this at sunrise and sunset, one can look right at the sun for that short period of time. Some people do it for minutes, some people do it for an hour, but there's a little window right as the sun is on the horizon that is better than a double cappuccino, I guarantee. I highly recommend it if you want your frequency to match the solar emanations that are going on now. So we're going to cover, I hope you don't leave when we take a break shortly because I want to cover some of the effects of those solar radiations that are coming in now. It's so powerful, it's really good to align. We've been taught to be afraid of the sun and it's going to you know, ruin us, but it's actually a source of great energy. The Nassenes, which were the ones related to Yeshua and his tribe, and the Essenes as well, combine chanting with sun gazing. This activates the Nadi channels, as well as the pineal gland and the mana of awakening and regeneration in the brain centers. When you circulate the breath and the energy, you, you touch all the centers, which is important. Here the initiates in Egypt are receiving the illumination and resonance from the stars. This is an ancient tradition. The Mayans do it. Here are the life-giving principles with the Ankhs coming down from the ray sun. Sunlight helps produce neurochemicals including HGH human growth hormone in the pineal gland, regulating mood, consciousness, energy levels, and longevity. The pineal gland generates a magnetic field and contains magnetite, thus interacting with magnetic fields of the sun and earth. For instance, places that are very magnetic, like Sedona. Places of red earth are always sacred places. Here are the seven serpents representing the seven awakened centers of the initiate. Horus, the sun, at the pituitary and pineal centers, symbolizing the sun awakened within the brain. And here's a wonderful quote from the dialogues of Kabir from the Sufi tradition. In the center between the two eyes is the seat of eternal music, the music of the spheres. And if we had more time, I would share many, many stories of how awakening this center, you begin to hear, many of you may do this already, hear the subtle sound currents, the music of the spheres, the sounds ringing in the air stronger at certain points, certain places. When I first went to Chartres Cathedral, I couldn't believe the symphony that was ringing like thousands of bells in the air like millions of swallows ringing and singing through the air. Ah. And we come to a completion of the first part of the great work. We began with the green snake initiating new beginnings. And we complete with the red. The full circuit, the inner circuitry connected.
What we're hearing on the recording is a uh, meditation on the tone G sharp. Now, in my system that I work with that has been handed down for quite a long time, um, that tone resonates with the galactic center. The Mayans call the center of our galaxy Hunabku, and Humbat's men explained it to me that it's shaped like a G, it's a spiral. It's the G letter, Khe in Mayan. So this tone you're hearing now is a G sharp, which could resonate with the galactic center and connect us with that expansion. Song of the Stars. Again, we have the sky and its stars are singing in you. From the Dendera Egypt Temple. In fact, all of creation hums in audible and inaudible tones. The word universe means one song. These universal tones are constantly bathing and communicating with us, as above, so below. In the wonderful Algonquin song, I don't know the melody they use, but the words are so incredible. We are the stars which sing. We sing with your light. We are the birds of fire. We fly across the heavens, and our light is a star which sings. Literally, literally so. The minerals in our bones and the iron in our blood began as an exploding star somewhere in space some time ago, long time ago. We are literally the stars which sing. There's a star map on the wall of Egypt. Marsilio Ficino, who created Neoplatonic academies during the Renaissance in Florence, Italy, wrote three books on life. He says, by their harmonious rays and motions, penetrating everything, planets daily influence our spirit secretly, just as music does openly. Nicholas Mann has created this wonderful star alignment with midwinter sunrise at the Glastonbury Tor in England and the mound touching it the center of the galaxy, touching us, touching all of us at this time, during this time of alignment. Nicholas has a whole period of 1980 to 2016, and I think if we're focusing too heavily on this one year, we're missing the point. We are in it, and it's going to keep going. That flowering huge solar mass ejection that occurred on 11, 11, 11. Now I have to admit, I was skeptical. I thought, they're just creating the 888 again or the 11, 11, 11, 10, 10, 10. Oh, you know, I mean, this isn't really holy day. It's not a turning point of the seasons, but guess what happened? The sun listened, the sun responded. So as people gathered around the earth, and they were praying and singing and chanting the largest wall of plasma that solar astronomers have ever seen erupted. Also at that same time, a gigantic magnetic rift appeared in the sun. It's really speaking now. And when we entered the year of the water dragon, 23rd and 24th of January, what do we get? A huge green dragon over water. The sun exploded, connected with that new moon.
By the way, that conjunction, sun and moon, was in the sign of Aquarius, signaling that jet engine boost into the current age and the shift. Astrophysicists are studying the song of the sun in a project they call GONG, Global Oscillation Network Group. Astrophysicists from all over the world are measuring the song of the sun to see how it is affecting life on Earth, and certainly we are seeing that it is. Shortly after 11-11-11, November 15th, the sun hit, the um, coronal mass ejection hit Venus, and this hurling plasma cloud reduced some of Venus's atmosphere. Now, there is a Hopi prophecy that speaks about when Venus's atmosphere changes, this signals we are in the time of great change and purification. And instead of being afraid of that, Celebrate! Are some of you just feeling so much energy, you just want to jump out of your skin? I am. There's so much potential right now. This is a disk of Venus pouring forth illumination, just like the Egyptian initiates were receiving. The direct resonance and illumination from the stars. The Aztec tradition says that Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent, emanates from Venus and will return to Earth in 2012. In a rare transit, Venus will pass directly in front of the Sun on June 6th this year. Only happens once in a lifetime, once every 120 years or so. Now, they come in pairs, so we had one transit in 2004, and this is the, the partner of that transit. For me, this is really the exciting thing. I mean, yes, winter solstice, all the solstices are powerful, but this is big. So I recommend everybody toning and chanting and praying every day, connecting with the sun, bringing the sunlight into your cells, into your centers of your brain to get ready because it's really wonderful what is happening now. Here's a Venus moon conjunction. She makes a perfect pentagram, the only planet in our solar system to make a perfect geometrical shape. Perfect pentagram in her orbit every eight years. This shape happens to be the one that is full totally, exclusively, of golden mean ratio, the perfection of creation. It's the basis of music, harmony, beauty, healing, and regeneration. So those are some of the qualities that I believe are coming in now very powerfully as blessings, as gifts if we pay attention and utilize them. You can even breathe in not only the sun, but the moon, or Venus, or Sirius, or whatever your favorite star is, to receive the knowledge. If you've ever worked with Venus or Sirius, I find them very, very powerful, in addition to the sun. You can receive knowledge, you can receive a song, a resonance transmission. This shows how far back from the 16th, this is a copy, a 7th century uh, copy, but back to 1600s BC, the Mesopotamian Babylonian traditions were recording the transits of Venus in these stones. This is from the British Library. And here's the symbol of Venus throughout Mesoamerica with Venus right here. This is right at South Mountain, Phoenix. These are called the Acker Lions of Yesterday and Today, and as we stand at the threshold of a new age and the ending of a 26,000 year cycle, this is the time to create what we want, our visions for the future. 
It's a new day in the history of humanity. And in the ancient traditions of the Middle East, God was expressed in several various ways as El or La, meaning the one or I am that I am. In Hebrew, Eloha, Elohim is plural, Eloha is singular, Elat in the old Canaanite, Allah or Allahu, Arabic, Allaha, Aramaic. So I'd like us to join together with another chant, and this time with the crystal ball and all of our voices harmonizing as you feel. And I want you to choose any of those words, the Eloha, Elohim, Elat, Allah, Allahu, Allaha. As you will, feel it. Create your own way of doing it. But try to listen to the other voices. And let's create a beautiful gift for the earth together. So I'm going to start it. And then I want you all to join in. human energy field is constantly interacting with the cosmos, sun, moon, stars, and earth resonance. These cosmic frequencies also influence all biological systems and growth patterns. Heavenly tones and song patterns are reflected in the human body and the energy field. This is a wonderful 15th century image of those celestial patterns as they affect the human energy field in the wonderful Vesca Piscis shape with all the zodiac around on the outside. Medieval text from the British Library showing the casting of a chart to see the star influence on a newborn child Medical and soul astrology have both been used by the ancient cultures for thousands of years 
including in our current time. Here's King Edward III being shown the planetary influence on trees and plants. The key is to restore all the frequencies, to become whole and integrated for healing. Here we see all the planets represented in all the color tones, the frequencies. These celestial tones can actually be measured in our voices. We can find the tone map to know where to work to liberate ourselves and to integrate. This is the basic wheel that I've been using since the early 90s with the zodiac of the 12 tones, 12 colors. This is a form of bioacoustic medicine and the goal is wholeness and integration. We have to know where we're dropping out, where the stress points are. Everything in creation is singing. String theory now proves this. Well, it's not really a theory anymore, is it? And all of life forms can be identified by their specific frequencies or formula of fre frequencies. Nothing's simple, is it? We are all made up of symphonies of frequencies. In the 1970s, University of Ohio sound researcher Sherry Edwards discovered that she could hear distinct tones emanating, emanating from individual people. When she sang the same note back that she heard, extreme, dramatic, immediate effects occurred. This gave her the hunch that she was on to something, and she was one of my first, more scientific teachers. My first teachers were life and nature and indigenous people. They have the same traditions. Edwards developed voice analysis to analyze individual voice tone patterns to find the sound signatures for healing. Therapeutic sound formulas are then created based on an individual's weak voice tones, what is dropping out. We have Alex Gray's wonderful art showing the network of light through the system. We use voice spectrum analysis to find the sound blueprint, tones for healing, to return our lost chord. The frequencies missing in the voice relate to limiting patterns and beliefs in the body-mind emotions. They also relate to genetic tendencies and karma, belief systems, emotional patterns. We all have them, but you can read them in the voice. Using one's signature tones reconnects the inner pathways, creating wholeness, freedom, and soul evolution. With a frequency analyzer, we measure the voice pattern to identify the strong and weak points. Combining this analysis of the voice results and the planetary tone chart, we've been seeing that these planetary and solar influences are affecting all biological forms, and each person has a tone pattern formed by the planetary patterns at birth. It forms a blueprint that can be changed. It's not a fated thing at all. You can work with it and shift it if you know what you're working with. So it's like the as above, so below, the hermetic tradition. As above in the, in the heavens, the moment of birth, below we receive that music in our own personal symphony. The voice is a barometer of the state of our beingness. The voice indicates one's character and the expression of one's spirit. Hazrat Inya Khan, Sufi master. The Sufi tradition, the esoteric aspect of Islam, which I wish came back stronger right now in the world, um, they carried a, 
tremendous amount of knowledge about working with the voice and the frequencies in the voice. He again said, the person who has found the keynote to their voice has found the key to their life. Here's a voice print of someone who's pretty out of balance here, heavy tones over on this side of the scale and nothing over here. It turned out that the issues for that person emotionally and physically were sitting right in these areas that were dropping out. Deepak Chopra also says something similar. The body is held together by sound. The presence of stress and disease indicates that some sounds have gone out of tune. So we're just bringing back the right tuning. What a time we live in where all the crystal bowls and tuning forks and toning and chanting are occurring. We live in that threshold between the ages that we have all potential to change everything with our song. That is actually the theme of the creation story of the Avapaya Apache people of this area. She listened to the songs of heaven when she emerged in Boynton Canyon, Komala Pokuya. She listened and she trusted what she heard and she sang and her song changed everything. Your song changes everything. Some of the effects of applying missing voice frequencies found by voice analysis are, isn't this a great image? From Scientific American, and I love it when this stuff bleeds through into all levels in science, technology. When individual frequencies are played back to a person, the change can be reflected at the cellular level, in brainwave patterns, unification of the energy field and in the experiential state of being. And this can happen immediately. It doesn't have to take a long time. Although things that have been kind of set in stone, as we say, in the bones, in the tissues, take a little longer to resolve. It can take a week, a month, a year, whatever. It just depends on how long standing a genetic uh, tendency or pattern in the body is or emotions. But through toning, you can release all that and clear it, not only for yourselves, but for your ancestors and those who will come after. Clearing the family lineage with sound. The sound that you're hearing, I'll turn it up a little bit. I decided to play the, um, I was doing the sun meditation this morning and I was told, use the A sharp, it's this tone for Aquarius. So I thought, okay, that's a good idea. And this is a sound meditation, 15 minute long, using didgeridoo, overtone chanting, mantras, and harp, so that people can tone along with these tones and assist them. Sometimes we don't know where to start. I didn't know where to start before I met my teachers. And this can be really helpful for people opening the door to their own sound medicine. Getting a crystal bowl or a tuning fork or a drum or whatever and toning along with it. There are 12 different sound meditations for the 12 tone musical scale. Each tone relates to specific nutrients, organs, physical functions, mental, emotional, and genetic patterns. Trying to cover all the bases there. Just to let you know that everything carries a frequency, even a thought, even a feeling. It all has frequency that can be measured. Therapeutic formulas are then created based on the frequencies stressed or missing in the individual voice and the planetary tone pattern. They mirror one another as above, so below. Cannot wait to show you how this is rooted in, in the traditions, in the mystical, Western mystical traditions in Europe. It, it goes from Egypt, Babylonia, and before, and then it filters into the West through the Hermetic texts. And it'll all start making sense. We're running a little short on time, but I'll just hit on a few of these 
cases that were really wonderful and striking. Um, in Mexico City, I've done a lot of work for many, many years, and the children in the clinics um, that they were using the Songaya sounds that you're hearing were suffering from limited motor response. They were frozen physically, as well as autism, an uh, inability to speak or share, come out of their shell. They saw coordinated movements, and what was interesting is they saw circular movements with these sounds like you're hearing. This is what they were using, and the children started moving in circles where there was no movement before because of the cyclic repeating kind of 60 beats per minute or slower. It just got them out of their shells. They began communicating, vocalizing with the music. Little autistic son, I've told this story before, he was speaking total gibberish. I could not understand him. I gave the, I did the analysis, got the voice print, and then I went over to the harp and stood at the other end of the harp. He had never seen a harp before. And he calmed down, and he played a duet with me. He was five years old. He'd never played an instrument before. And at the end, he kissed me on the cheek and said, harp. And so immediately, his parents got him an instrument. And he began naturally playing music in his missing tones that he needed. It's a natural response. When we hear the sounds we need, we resonate and feel good. We want to use those. We want to hear them. Oh, in a dolphin project I was uh, doing with uh, autistic and disabled children in Mexico City, Dr. Fritz Zimmerman said that the, there was a synchronization with the waveforms between the therapists, the dolphins, and the children in a state beyond separation. And in that state, the children came out of isolation and they could communicate. They, they began to develop all of their sensory abilities. All of these are online. You can see them on the voice analysis page. This is fun. This was a wonderful local client. After one week of toning her C, C-sharp, which relates to root chakra issues, sex, money, power, she was more relaxed, uplifted, libido increased dramatically. I should use that on television <laughs> if I ever wanted to get really busy. Second week, she was more calm, aligned with her true purpose, and she made a major business gain. Again, root chakra things. A guy who was kind of a bit mousy got really empowered, and their relationship improved a great deal. Basal temperature, thyroid balancing. use in body work and other therapies, it can increase the efficacy. This is an interesting one. I didn't show you the images because I was in my underwear and it's really embarrassing. But the video in imaging footage uh, taken up in Bellevue, Washington with the same doctor I mentioned earlier, Dr. Juan Acosta, showed that there was increased light in and around the body after toning a very short time, like a minute. And dark congested areas became 60% brighter and the same result occurred while holding feelings of bliss and gratitude. So I highly recommend toning with the state of gratitude. Find something that you can appreciate about yourself or another and focus on that feeling of gratitude and it totally shifts your frequencies within and without. Here's a family in Portland. Now the husband's singing all the time. I hope <laughs> she enjoys it. And they're singing as a family. Now that's wonderful.
Neoplatonic academies. I'm just going to recap. This is just a couple of slides, a few slides. But to recap some of the basic principles that we started with, the hermetic sound traditions from ancient Egypt. This is Marsilio Ficino, and he was the first one in the uh, Florence area in the 15th century to translate the entire body of hermetic teachings called the Corpus Hermeticum. This painting, by the way, is from Leonardo da Vinci. They had quite a crew of incredible artists and thinkers and uh, practitioners of these sacred arts during that era. And they exploded these traditions into Europe and there was a great flowering. In his academy in Florence, there was a sparking and flowering of the hermetic wisdom into the West. They combined the study of astrology, music, and medicine. Sound familiar? The same principles over and over throughout time. Music, astrology, music, and medicine. Astrology, planetary patterns, voice patterns. It's the same thing. Pythagoras used to uh, make sound formulas based on the planetary configurations for each person with voice and lyre. According to the 3rd century BC historian priest Manetho, Thoth was a counselor to Osiris and later assisted Isis in ruling Egypt. Manetho says that second, the second Thoth Hermes, apparently it was a tradition, a lineage, translated teachings from ancient stone tablets from the first Thoth. These became the 42 books of Hermes housed in the Egyptian temples. The first book was called The Chanter, and the next four books were a series on astronomy called Horoscopus. Interesting, eh? Same themes. Here we have Orpheus and his lyre from the Byzantine Museum in Athens. These academies used music based on a person's horoscope as therapy to heal both body and soul. We combine medicine and Orpheus's lyre. To the Egyptian priests, medicine, music, and the mysteries were one and the same. And I love Ficino. And we play the lyre precisely to avoid becoming unstrung. Music according to the rule of the stars, the motions of the heavens, and an individual's horoscope will engender a forceful, celestial, healing power. The Chino. The stars are singing to each one of us. As above, so below, and the beauty of the song of creation. Diamond.
is now the sea.